machine that I could be a cog in. This is a problem. I'm trying to leave it in God's hands. God's plan. Not even God's family. Hi, Shad. How you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm well. Thanks for asking. Uh, well, I'm all right. Yeah. Every day I'm a little sad since uh, one of my heroes, Norm MacDonald, passed away, and I know he meant a lot to you as well. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm good, but I was hit by that news too, Vish. Yeah. You know, we're both huge fans, and I listened to your remembrance, I was telling you, Yeah. of Norm. I've been listening to a lot of those. Yeah. Yeah, Bob Saget did a good one. I listened to that one. Oh, I haven't heard that one. I gotta, I gotta hear that one. Yeah, I listened to a bit of Artie Lang, and I listened to the Conan one with Andy Richter. Yeah, and uh, the producer there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That one is good. Now, it, yeah. it uh, I, I first knew that you were a huge Norm fan because yeah. that's you can just correct. I'm gonna go for it. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna try to use my memory right now. Yeah, but in my memory, many years ago now. People probably know that you used to host the show Q That's on right. CBC Radio. And they did a thing when they were looking for a host where they they put people on the air for like weeks, like auditioning on air, basically, just trying people out. Yeah. And at some point, it came around to you. And to be frank with you, it's the only show I listen to straight through because I love you and your guest that day was Norm Mac- one of your guests that day I should say was Norm MacDonald. So I listened to that whole thing and that was to my memory that was the only audition you had. So like yeah. I said they had some people weeks and weeks of hearing them or whatever at least a week. You'd hear someone a week but I feel like you did one and then you got the job. Is that right? Um I no I guess hosted for a week. Oh, you did a week? Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, no, yeah, I so, did yeah. guess those for a week. Or at least or at least four days or something like that. It was, did you? It was okay. for a while. But Norm was at the end of that week. Oh, uh, okay. I got it all twisted. I'm sorry. I thought you got it I thought you did one yeah. and done and they're like, that's the guy. <laughs> Even though other people had been doing it forever, and I thought, yeah. well, that's a testament to you. Oh, but anyway, okay. Yeah. Well, but so so that is something that is astounding to me because he didn't. He did a lot of interviews, but he also didn't do a lot of interviews. How did you feel? Oh yeah, getting to talk to Norm. Yeah, like like look, the guy is known as the the greatest talk show guest of all <laughs> ever, time. Of all time. Yeah. And so, in my week of hosting this show, my week of hosting any <laughs> radio program, we get Norm. Like, this is insane, <laughs> you know? So, but beyond that, like, I was just a huge fan. Yeah, I heard it. I heard yeah. it when you were asking him the questions. You picked up on nuances in his comedy mm-hmm. on account of... On like, account, I yeah. remember you, you brought that up, and he, he seemed to enjoy that. Again, this is my memory. It might, might be fuzzy, but that's what I remember. Mm-hmm. Uh, what was that day like? Because in my memory, Norm kind of took over the show on some level. Was that fair? Of course, and I was um, I was definitely prepared for that to happen. I was expecting that to happen because he notoriously, as a guest, does not comply with anything or conform to any <laughs> plan that you might have, right? So, um, actually, after he he died, I was texting a little bit with Chris Berube, who produced that. Oh segment yeah, Chris, yeah, with Norm, yeah. and I was telling Chris like I I think Chris sketched out a good plan because the plan that Chris had was pretty serious questions, reflective questions. Yeah. And um, so I think it was nice that it, it was kind of grounded in that and I could demonstrate how much I respected him through that. And then I think from there, he, he obviously took it where he took it. There were points in, in that interview where he would launch into bits and I would just be dying <laughs> laughing <laughs> but it, it, it felt surreal at the time because he is the greatest talk show guest of all time and because I'm such a huge fan it felt surreal at the time I felt so grateful then and I just feel even more grateful now and it yeah. makes me think about that short time we got to spend together in conversation differently knowing that he had cancer yeah that's right he would have had what year was this uh, Shad do you remember that was maybe 2014 maybe late 2014 or early 2015 yeah so he, yeah, something like that. So he yeah. had cancer, and when I think about the tenderness that he had for me and the other people that were he there, he was very supportive. He was advocating for you to get the job. That's on right. the air, as I recall. Yeah, 
That's right. I, I don't, don't even, know. Is this a, is this available? Like I haven't listened to it since it, the day it came out. Yeah, you can you can listen to it on on YouTube. Yeah, and I was I was actually texting with Tom Power too about it because Tom got to talk to him um, a yeah. couple of years after after I did, and they had a great chat. And Tom's a huge fan, and it was the same way, you know, with Tom. He was he was so kind, and I think, and you reflected on this too, like. I think when he could tell you really loved him, he loved you too. Yeah. That's the hardest thing for me. So it's a weird thing, right? Because you don't... We have these moments with these people. Uh, in my remembrance, I talked about how I, I really only met him in person once. Uh, but but because I would cover... And, and I told that story and people can listen to it. But basically, I got to introduce him on stage for some surreal reason. The promotions company was like, why don't you introduce Norm? And I was like, what? Okay. Like, I was a minor, you know, I was a Radio 3 radio person, but I don't think they even knew that. I had just reached out. Well, I mean, they must have known that because I said I have a show and blah, blah, blah. But why they would take the leap from you are someone we, do, I'm guessing we don't know you, they don't know me, but they're like, why don't you go on stage? It was a very Norm incident, as, as I, like, when I think on it, right? But, um, all this to say, uh, that was 2011, I figured out, and I loved the guy since like 1992, 1993. Like the yeah. first time I probably encountered him was on Letterman or and then Conan, which I would ardently watch. I would record those shows on school nights, obviously. They were week, weekday shows, and I would watch them the next day. So he, I encountered him, but I didn't. But then when he got on SNL, I fell in love with him. And then I met him like 20 years later or something. And I, as I said on stage, like I talk like Norm, uh, I do, I, I know it. And I, I, you know, I, I don't know, I just on account of the way he talks, you start talking like him. Right. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and so I, that was it. That was the one time, but then I would cover him and he knew that, like I would write about him or I would talk about him on CBC or wherever. And he, like you say, he recognized my love for him and mm-hmm. it's very hard it's difficult because he's a celebrity. Everyone who loves him is mourning him. But we had these fleeting moments with him, as we do with people in our work, uh, as you've done with your work on hip hop evolution. On in your very, you you uh-huh. encounter people, and when they go, that's your moment with them. So I, I've been wrestling yeah. with like to publicly mourn someone for such. In, in a deeply personal way when you had these fleeting encounters with them, but at the same time, yeah. you were so immersed in their life and work. Yeah. Like, in some ways, I know Norm better than some of my relatives. Yep. Because I've just... Anyway, I've been yeah. wrestling with that. I don't know. Have you had that? Like, I don't know if you've done a lot of public mourning for Norm that I've seen, but I mean, yeah. I know you, and I, you and I have been texting as well, and uh, mm-hmm. it's a hard yeah. one, isn't it? Well, yeah, and I think... The thing that is beautiful to me is that there are certain people like Norm that you love. You know, there, there's greats that pass on and you have great admiration for their work, but you don't feel affection for yeah. them. Norm, yeah. for whatever reason, was a guy that fans felt an affection for. And I, it, it was a mix of how relatable he was and also mysterious he was, or something. I don't know what it is actually, Vish. Like, but I, th- I think it's I think it's partially that yeah he took risks. Mm-hmm. You and I, you know, I, I know some of our shared interests, and we're drawn to the rebellious. Yeah, and we're drawn to the people who don't seem to care about the consequences of their verbal actions on some level let's say let's say it that way i'm I'm not advocating for criminals but you and i are moral people shad let's not get it twisted here but but norm did not seem to care about what the consequences would be of what he said and he was not afraid to go for it and to to his detriment he got fired from Saturday Night Live for the things he basically said. Can you imagine? Yeah. I mean, this is very commonplace now <laughs> in workplaces. If you say the wrong thing anywhere, they find out and they say, we don't want it. You said something, that's enough. Whether you, what the, but he was a comedian and for a long time you could get away 
It's over now, of course. Comedy yes. is dead. But for a long time, you could be a comedian and say whatever you wanted, and people understood the context was comedy. But so I think it's partially that we, some of us, I think, could kind of live vicariously through him mm. because he was the risk taker. He was the one who went on Conan and Letterman and said outlandish, outrageous things. But also, I like I said in my remembrance, there was always usually a humanity to the crassness. There was a humanity to the harshness. Yeah. So that's why he was relatable. But um, I mean, I yeah. was. You must admit, I've been sharing links, video clips of Norm on on my the show, my Creative Control Twitter feed, about once a day. And there's somewhere I have to stop myself. Like I'm like I can't share that one. It doesn't reflect well on him, maybe because it's dated language or dated. But at the same time, I'm laughing hysterically. So like, it's to the point where I'm so chicken. <laughs> to associate my with some some of his commentary, but it's so genius at the same time. Do you know what I'm where I'm coming from? I think Chris Rock has this too. If you go through his old stuff, like some of it, ugh, yeah, doesn't maybe shouldn't resonate as well. Anyway, he said things that a lot of us couldn't say mm-hmm. or wouldn't say, but we appreciated that he said them, yeah. and they were risky things, and they self they seemed like self sabotage, which made him more endearing. But I also think we could live vicariously through his rebelliousness. Yes, I think that that's true. I think that that was part of what was admirable about about him. I think that it was always, like you said, there was always a humanity to it. It was always outrageously funny, which is, I don't know, it just it it just felt like he did everything in service of making people laugh, including yeah. never disclosing the fact that he was battling cancer you know what i mean yeah. like everything was so in service he was so brilliant but yeah that ne- he never allowed that to take precedence over making people laugh there truth were as well uh, truth and an elite the yeah, truth, truth, uh, whatever the truth is it, it, it could hurt it could be bad but i think he had a real allegiance to the truth which is i think why he thought comedy was so significant yeah. Comedy is inher- it's the, it is the inherent truth that we can't talk about. And a lot of again, it can be misused. It yeah. can be you can use it for evil. I yeah. think if you if you if you're not a good person, but he I thought he he yeah, uh, there's a truth in everything he said and did, which I I don't want to quote Jack Nicholson, but people mm. can't handle the truth sometimes. Mhm. Yeah. A- and like I loved I loved how committed he was to his craft. I loved how much he loved his craft, how much he loved writing and words. Yeah. He's very smart. He's incredibly smart. Did you see that thing that came out that he graduated high school at like 14 and was in university at 16? Yeah, I saw that you shared that. But that, like, that's not surprising when you look at his writing, his book, or even his approach to comedy. I had a little exchange with him on, on Q where we're talking about comedy and if it's an art form. And I suggested to him that I think comedy is maybe the highest art form because laughter is such a universal and unifying thing and because comedy can communicate so much in just like one phrase or whatever. And he was adamant that comedy is not art, it's a craft. And he had a beautiful articulation for for why that is why he saw it that way and it was so humble to hear him talk about that like to to hear his humility in that because you know how much he loves writing you know how much he cares about literature and how much he cares about words and you also know that there's no false modesty in the guy like he's just he's truly a humble person was a truly humble person who thought this is how it is. Like, you just really, you admire how much he had his head around what he was doing to the point where he's like, no, comedy's not an art form. You can, it can be layered. You can, ha- there, it can be brought to that level, but, but fundamentally, it's a craft and this is why it's a craft. And these, these forms of writing are art and this is why. And, uh, and in moments like that, like, I don't know, I'm, I'm rambling a little bit, but, um, but well, all this of these, is worthy, but these are, it's, a, it's worthy of norm your ramble if i might say all of these things are part to me of part of why i fell in love with the guy you know 
there are so many levels to him. Yeah, but he, I, I get what you're saying. I think he had a total love of language and, and was immersed in, in sort of highfalutin philosophical profundity. However, he would say things like, uh, the other day I was at the zoo and I saw a ape. Exactly. He would, he would, he would change, he would talk. He would he would alter his diction to sound like a bumpkin, yes, or to sound less wise and smart than he was, and I always thought that was fascinating. He's gone on rants about he had gone on a bunch of rants about why Letterman was a preferable uh, interviewer and critical analyst compared to someone like Bill Maher, because Letterman never acted like he was smart. He always acted like a humble Midwestern. Guy, even though he wasn't, he is incredibly smart. Whereas Mar, people like Bill Mar, really want to present themselves as smart. Yeah, that's fascinating in itself. Because you, I feel like you have this. I, I, there's so many moments on your new record that make me like la- all your records, where you go high, you go low with your jokes. And that to me is a uh, that's the norm in you. Uh, that's that- that's high praise, Vish. I really appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> because you know, you know how much I a- admire Norm for that. If if I do it, he did it on such a higher level. I love how you pointed that out because it's exactly right. He could write the most beautiful, precise thing and say the most beautiful, or he could say half a hour. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> half a hour. I have only been at it for half a hour. Yeah, I can hear him. Saying that. There's a very famous exchange where Larry... I can't remember the word right now. I'm blanking on it. But Larry King's trying to correct him on a word. Uh, and they just... He's like, what do you mean? He's just going... He's just adamant that the way he's saying a word... Yeah. That is just fun with English. Yeah. When he says it's a craft, I get it. But he was an artist with language. And... Yeah. So, it's very hard. The mm-hmm. only... I, I, I appreciate us going in on it because... Uh, this is how we grieve, I think, people mm-hmm. like us. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's As we're speaking, it's been uh, just over a week or so since uh, the news. So it's still, and like I say, I live with it every day. I watch 510. I thought it would be really hard to watch the Norm clips, but I'm on a, I can't, I always did. I, I Before he passed, I watched Norm every day. Yeah. Saturday morning, where's Papa? Oh, he's got his phone up there in the bed and he's just watching Norm clips. So it's bad. I should get up and make everyone breakfast, but... I, I, he's just always, he brightens up my day. Yeah. And those appearances on those shows, like you say, are the best. But I want to say this, a couple mm-hmm. things about the Q thing before we leave it. He was kind of notorious for either not doing pre-interviews or rendering the pre-interviews moot when showtime <laughs> came. So he might spend time with a segment producer, and then you go on the air, and you can see, like, Letterman and Conan in particular, just, they knew him enough that they gave up. There's no blue card, really, except for whatever, you know, the, he was plugging. But, and Stewart, John Stewart as well, like, screw it, I'm not gonna, there's no point, the pre-interview. So I wonder about that, you mentioned Chris Berube, so I'm mm-hmm. wondering about that on Q, but I also just wonder if you have any insights about mm-hmm. Between the Breaks. Uh, yeah. we, we heard what we heard, but I wonder if you can mm-hmm. shed insight on those two things. What was he like before the show started with Chris, to your knowledge? Maybe you weren't involved in that. And what mm-hmm. was he like on the show between the red light being on, knowing you were on air? Can you speak to those two things? Yes. I'm not sure if he did a pre-interview. I have a feeling he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> based on your your memory of the experience, I'm it, guessing. Yeah, based on my memory of the experience, I don't think he did a pre-interview I think he came in, you know, just kind of as a favor and, and and on a whim. Like, it was interesting to hear Conan talk about how it was hard to pin him down. Like, they wanted to get him on his podcast, and he, like, wouldn't do it. He kept kind of like, like I was like, that's so interesting, you know? Um, well, I, so, I don't mean to, I just, yeah. not to cut you off there, I don't mean to throw you throw myself into this, ga- you mm-hmm. and Tom Power and Conan, like, mm-hmm. you guys highest order in terms of uh, broadcast platforms and all those things. But Norm and I, he followed me on Twitter. Mm-hmm. And then I, like, I obviously already followed him. And so we followed each other, which meant, uh, maybe he had his DMs open all the time, but it meant we could exchange messages. And I would frequently ask him if we could do an interview. In fact, that night, 
uh, the night after the show in 2011, I asked if I could run home and grab my proper recording equipment. And he was like, oh, yeah, yeah, maybe, I don't know. And then it, I could tell he didn't really want to do it, you know? Yeah. But anyway, on Twitter, and so we would DM about it and he'd say, yeah, absolutely. And then even publicly, if I tweeted at him in public, hey, can we chat? He'd retweet it. He'd, he'd yeah. re, like, he'd quote tweet it and say, certainly. So just very publicly saying we would talk. And now this is in the time frame that we now know he had cancer because to mm-hmm. your point conan and andy and everyone on the show was like we tried to pin him down now we know probably why yeah we couldn't he was he was ailing so i had the same experience where he would say i would say great what about thursday yeah thursday maybe let's do that and then wednesday would come around and like what time tomorrow norm gone <laughs> uh so and you know everyone had stories about you text norm spade spade david spade would say hey norm i'm in town you want to hang out and then three weeks later He'd get a text saying, "Hey, what do you want?" Like, so I get. <laughs> so you had that experience, probably. Sorry, I didn't mean to interject, but I desperately wanted to talk to him on the record. Yes, and it never. And he always said we would do it. I mean, we, the last exchanges we had were, it was in 2020, and he, it was during the pandemic. And he told me he had been living in Kelowna. He was in the woods wow. at one point, but he had been living in Kelowna, British Columbia. And I was like, and I was asking me a lot about Edmonton because I told him I had moved and it was like, what's that like? And I, I didn't know if he was just making conversation or if he was deciding I'm going to live in Canada wow. for what he maybe thought was the rest of his life. Yeah. Uh, I mean, what he thought was the rest of his short, short, shortened life. Um, sorry, I really interjected there, but I just no. want to say hard to pin down. I, yeah, sorry. You were yeah, saying hard yes. to pin down. No, that's that. That's it, it, that. That totally relates. Yeah, hard, hard to pin down. So I'm guessing we didn't get a pre-interview. Yeah, we, but I also because I don't remember any notes about. Oh, he said this in the pre-interview. Right. <laughs> I don't remember. So that's probably also an indication that there was no pre-interview. Um, what I remember between segments, or at least before we sat down, I did tell him that I went to see him in Vancouver. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. And he asked, oh, like, you know, many years ago, like in SNL days or whatever. And I was like, no, like, like a year ago. I went to see you like yeah. a year ago. And I do think that changed something, you know, in him um, because he could he could tell, no, I, like, I'm a, I'm a fan. And actually, I'll yeah. tell you, the, the reason I went to see that show was because I went on a long drive with a friend and we were listening to comedy the whole drive. And the first album we put in was somebody had crafted this. It was brilliant. It was like their whole life story wrapped in a comedy show. It was great. It was amazing. And it, you could tell it's like their their life's work. This is like their magnum opus. And then we put in Norm. And Norm just says something about how he doesn't understand the business section and how he likes the NASDAQ when it's up. <laughs> <laughs> not, not when it's down. Uh-huh. He, likes it yeah. when it, he likes it when it goes up. Yeah. And... Uh, I had to pull over the car, V. <laughs> I had to pull over the car. It wasn't safe yeah. for me to drive. I was laughing so hard. The more I... Yeah. He had gone on to a couple minutes later, but I kept thinking about him saying, Ah, oh, down. Oh, I like when it's up. <laughs> and, uh, and after that, I had, to, I had to buy a ticket. And it was all the old time, like on account of and and stuff like that, and so um, the old way of talking, yeah. Anyway, so yeah, so the, all I remember from our talking between segments or before was that, and I also remember how tender he was. Like after that, he was, "Hey, love you, Shad," and you know, "I love you, Norm." Like, and yeah, he yeah. talked in that kind of language. And when I look back at it now, it's like, yeah, that's a tenderness that comes with age, I think, and a tenderness that comes with knowing that you might not have all the time in the world and you want to make sure that you, you know, share your feelings. So, uh, yeah. I think I think the public firing hurt him. Hmm. Uh, I think he felt really, he, uh, you know, he would never admit it. I don't know this from anyone else. My assessment is, because if you watch Weekend Update and his comedy up to that point, he was a very hard guy. Hmm. Uh, almost... Like, the sentiment that you're talking about might have come from age, but I think when he started to feel that love after that rejection from Letterman a lot of the times and Conan a lot of the times, but from people like you and me, 
he was like, okay. Like, it actually did resonate with him mm-hmm. when you said to him or conveyed to him via a review or saying you went to his show. He viewed that as love. Mm-hmm. And I, I've, when I was talking about, uh, I did a similar kind of remembrance episode about my, about David Berman from Silver Jews and, I, I articulated something that I've been thinking about, and I think sometimes when I invite people onto my show, it, it, the subtext is "I love you." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the subtext is "I." Uh, that meets that. That's, that's not true. I don't think of a lot of network television or radio because it's just a hamster wheel. Yeah. But this thing that I do is, or the things I do, I think I'm a critic, but I'm a fan. So I've stopped writing hatchet pieces when I'm assigned something because I don't have to. Mm-hmm. I have my own ability to just talk to or about whatever I want and I've decided to spend my time expressing love yep. uh, for things mostly. Well, not being totally uncritical, but like, so my point is I think when I write lovingly about him or his his Netflix show or his whatever it is, he in inter- and when you said I saw you in Vancouver a year ago, to me, for him, that was I love you. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And so then at the end of the interview or conversations, yeah. I love you. Yep. I sent I, I you might might have seen this and I felt a little sheepish about it. I shared a screen I did a screenshot of a tweet exchange between Norm and I, and I had sent him it was by the way, he had it was just classic Norm. About to launch his Netflix show, decides to go on talk shows and defend or, or, or try to speak to what he thought the hardship for people like Louis C.K. and Roseanne was at the time, just as his show is launching. Yeah. So it killed all momentum for the show. So I sent him, and I had already written a review of the show, exclaimed, agreed, you know, it was this cancel culture stuff was going on, but he, and he was really being, what, you remember that? People really went at him. A couple of years ago, I I don't I, vaguely vaguely yeah. yeah I know we'll, we'll talk about this when we get into your record I know you unplug yeah uh, from <laughs> the machines as much as you can but uh, anyway I had already written this review and it was up and I sent it to him when he was very low yeah and I shared this exchange because his comment back to me after sending him a review which I get it like it might seem sycophantic or uh, like you you're just you know. To me, that's, Norm, I love you, I wrote about your show. But I can see other people being like, of course you sent that to him, you kiss ass or whatever the hell, you know? But I didn't think of it that way. I just, like, my the guy my guy is low. Yeah. I've already written this loving thing about his train wreck of a Netflix talk show. And I sent it to him, and he wrote back something like, thank you, Vish, thank you, you are a true friend. Hmm. That, to me, is a, a recognition of not only love, but loyalty to him. Yeah. And I think he... So when you say, I saw you a year ago, not when you were on the biggest star on, tele- on comedy, of comedy and television, I saw you a year ago, that's a loyalty you expressed, too. So, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, and, yeah. I, I, yeah, I hear a lot in what you're saying, Vish. I mean, first of all, it's like, that's why I love your sh- podcast. Oh, Thanks. Because it really is effortless in in that in that sense of you're interested in ev- every guest. This isn't uh, it's not a homework assignment for you, no. and I don't think it's antithetical to being a music critic or, or a journalist to be coming from a place of love, and that that connects to what we're talking about with Norm too. You know, yeah. he was coming from a place of love with what he was doing, love for his craft, love for his audience, like you and me. Yeah. And that didn't make him any less of a comic. And in fact, he had, you know, all his criticisms of Bill Maher and, and other... Co- like, he didn't like mean-spirited, smug stuff. He hated that. Yeah. So, yeah, that's uh, that's what we're all trying to do, is come from a good place with what we're doing. Yeah. So, yeah, this is... I appreciate this. It, it is... It's the hardest one, you mm-hmm. know... Yeah, to your earlier point, like when David Bowie goes, yeah, we all love David Bowie. I love David Bowie. And it's not because we didn't have this personal connection either. But I, I, guess, I guess I'll say I wasn't in love with David Bowie. I appreciated David Bowie. I admired him. I recognized that he changed things. But Norm, 
this comedian, this nightclub comic, as he called himself, just had this profound effect on a whole generation of us, and it's uh, no, it's very difficult. Anyway, and, and I will yeah. say that the flow of the universe, for me, has been disrupted with him gone. Like, I feel like when a comedian of his stature and power goes, the world is literally a sadder place. There's a person who made me laugh yeah. that is gone, and so this could be a nice segue into a record called Down. Let's do what it. What do you think? 